And so the Bible, these are just a couple of verses, but there are several places in the Bible where it talks about the favor of the Lord. And as I look back on my life now, lived quite a few years, and I can see times in my life where I've had the favor of the Lord. But I also see times in my life where I felt the discipline of the Lord. You know, the Bible tells us that He disciplines those whom He loves. And just as you would your child. So here's what I've discovered. I enjoy the favor of the Lord more than the discipline. <laughs> I don't know if you're that way, but uh, that's, that's what I've come to the conclusion. I really enjoy that favor. And so the question then is, well, how do we get the favor of the Lord? Is it just luck? Do we just, you know, sometimes we get his favor, sometimes we get his discipline, and it's just sort of, no. There are certain things that you and I can do so that we fall under his favor. There's a couple football teams playing today in a big game. I don't know if you've heard about it. But uh, did those teams just get lucky and get there? No. They're pretty good teams. They're two, probably the two best teams in the NFL at this point. And I saw a story with Tom Brady earlier this week. And when they won the, the championship of the NFC, with the right to go to the Super Bowl, one of the players on his team afterwards in the dressing room was actually crying. And Tom Brady came up to him and said, stop crying. He says, this isn't over yet. We've got more work to do. We're, we want to win the Super Bowl. It's not just enough to get here. And so it's that kind of attitude that has got them to where they are. It wasn't just luck. It's hard work. It's planning. It's as uh, Don was pointing out, uh, and then we get rewarded. So anyway, we want to look at how do we obtain the favor of the Lord. And number one in your notes, we obtain favor with the Lord when we make Him the top priority in our lives. He needs to be number one. And we all have priorities in our lives. You know, what's the most important thing in your life? It needs to be God. Is when God is top priority, then we fall into His favor. And the verses I want to point out are in James chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And it says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hostility with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures say in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? All right. Now that last phrase, the spirit that dwells in us yearns jealously, that's been a problem for even scholars to interpret. But we're going to take a stab at it today. We want to <clears throat> sort of sort this verse out. And first of all, I would point out, letter A there says, the Spirit who dwells in us is the Holy Spirit. If we can clear that up right away. Did you know that when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us? We're told that several times in Scripture. What well, one place is John 14, and it says, If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus was telling his disciples, when you are, become a follower of me, when you receive Christ into your life, he says, you're also going to be receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to be in your life. And so that's part of our verse here. The Spirit that dwells within you, that's the Holy Spirit. Okay, you say, all right, that's pretty simple, but uh, bear with me on letter B. God, whose Spirit lives in us, is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. Now, we don't 
talk about that much, but uh, that's what it says in Exodus chapter 20. This is part, actually, of the Ten Commandments. It says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. So God is a jealous God. And then in Exodus 34, he goes on to say, For you shall worship no other God. For the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Did you know the Lord, one of the names for the Lord is jealous. He really wants us to put him number one. All right, so we have the Spirit dwelling within us, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and God is a jealous God. <clears throat> All right, letter C, going along with this thought, the next thing, Jesus relates to the church, that's you and I, as believers in Christ, we're part of the universal church, not just this church. Uh, Jesus relates to the church in the same way a husband relates to his wife. Now, you've probably seen these verses in the New Testament, but Ephesians 5, just remind you, it says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, <clears throat> and he is the Savior of the body. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So that says a whole lot, but what we want to get out of that today is that Jesus relates to you and I the same way that a husband is supposed to relate to a wife. Now, he's the perfect example. Uh, all right, so the Spirit dwells within us. The Spirit is jealous as God's Spirit. And Jesus relates to all of us as believers just like a husband relates to a wife. Now here's the final part of that. Letter D, God is jealous toward us when we do not honor Him as a, just in the same way as a husband is jealous toward an unfaithful wife. Now think about that for a minute. In fact, that is brought out in Proverbs chapter 6. And this is talking about a husband-wife relationship. It says, whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get. And his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's fury. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. Now, this is just talking about a natural reaction in a husband-wife relationship. And if you don't believe this, just turn on the news channel. And almost every day, you'll see an instance where the police were called out to a place of domestic violence. And they won't usually say this, but the reason for a lot of domestic violence is because of unfaithfulness. Sometimes even to the point of murder. Because there are strong feelings when there's unfaithfulness. We all know that. Now, I'm not saying that that is right, and neither is the Bible. It's just saying it's a natural re reaction. Vengeance is not ours. Vengeance is the Lord's. And anger is not even a right that we have. Anger, is, it's okay for God to have righteous indignation, but not for us. Uh, and so this point is brought out that he is a jealous God, and we're not to be jealous. That's for him. But as a jealous husband, he wants us to be, he wants to be number one in our lives. Now, I'll wrap it all up by this, a little story. Uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I was in a math class, and I, I loved math when I was in school, and uh, I, I really loved to study. It was actually a geometry class, 
And I had the privilege of being in this geometry class as a freshman in high school. And so was my buddy, and his name was also Steve. So we were both Steves, and we both, our, our last names both started with MC. And they were both hard names to say. And so this was a new teacher. He really didn't know us, and he had trouble with our names. And so after a couple of months of class, he said, you know, I'm going to simplify things, and I'm going to call you both Steve. And he said, and, and to my buddy, he says, you're Steve number one. And to me, he said, you're Steve number two. Now, how do you think that made me feel? <laughs> I was trying to impress this teacher. I wanted to be number one. But here was my buddy that I had competed with all through the years. He was faster than I was. He was a little bit smarter than I was. But I wanted to be number one. But he was number one. You know what? God wants to be number one in our lives. He doesn't want to be number two or number ten. He wants to be number one, and when he's not, then we don't fall into his favor. But when he is, then we, we gain his favor. All right, all that for number one. Now number two, we obtain favor with God when we humble ourselves. James 4, 6, and 10 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. We don't lift ourselves up. When we humble ourselves, then he lifts us up. Now, it talks here about he gives more grace. And what is grace? It's in your notes there. Grace is God's unmerited grace. Favor. And that's what we're talking about today. God's favor. And so when we get grace, when we get more grace, we get more of His favor. And wouldn't you like to have more favor with God? Well, here's how you do it. You humble yourself. We humble ourselves. And how do we humble ourselves? Well, one way, and we're going to talk about more, but one way is to put the needs of others ahead of our own needs. Put the needs of others first, and then we're humbling ourselves. Philippians 2.4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, Ann and I went on a date yesterday. We don't get to go on many dates these days because of COVID. But we had a date, and, and for our date, we went to the dump out here in... Uh, Wow. Coffin's Butte. <laughs> it was an exciting day. <laughs> she was so impressed. And I told her on the way out, this is, a, this is our date. You know, this, this counts. And uh, she had a good laugh over that. But uh, we, I don't know if I've told you, but over the holidays, we, our refrigerator sprang a leak. Uh, in the back of the refrigerator, there's a little hose that hooks up for your ice maker and you can get water. And, well, that hose decided to spring a leak, just a little pinhole leak, but we didn't know it was there, and over the course of a few days, our floor just got soaked behind the refrigerator, and then it began to seep out into where we could actually see it. Well, by then, a lot of damage had been done, and so we called the insurance company, and they sent out the adjuster, and he came out, and he said, well, you need to replace the whole floor, or he said they would replace the whole floor. So we, our house has been torn up here for the last few weeks. We're getting ready for our new floor, which is coming tomorrow. But in order to get ready for that, we had to haul off the old floor, and so we had to load it up in the pickup and take it out to the dump. And so that was quite a process, and, and Anne went along so she could help me because some of, the, some of the things were really heavy. We had some carpet that was heavy, and so anyway, it, took, it was a two-person job, and she went along, with that. So anyway, we backed up the truck and, and got it all emptied out. Well, as we were doing that, I didn't even notice this, but another pickup pulled up right next to us, backed in, and it was stacked up and loaded. Now, ours wasn't that big of a load, uh, but theirs was, or, or hers, was overflowing, and it was huge. And I thought to myself, wow, I hate that I have to unload that. <laughs> That's going to take some time. 
But my wife is a humble person. And this lady came out of the pickup. She was by herself. And so my wife, being perceptive to other people's needs, says, do you want some help with that? You want some help unloading that? And I'm thinking to myself, why did you say that? We're in a hurry. We've got more work to do at home. We've got all these things we've got to do. Uh, and she offers to help this other lady. And I'm thinking, I'm praying to God, please have her say no. <laughs> and it so happened that the lady was, she was kind of proud that she had loaded. She said, if I loaded this up, I can unload it myself. I thank you, Lord. But I wasn't being humble, but she was. She was looking out for the needs of others. And that's what you and I need to do. As we do that, we humble ourselves and we gain the favor of the Lord. Now, that phrase that we just read, where he gives more grace uh, and humble ourselves, sandwiched in between those two verses, 6 and 10, there are some other ways that we can humble ourselves. Number three... We humble ourselves and gain the favor of God when we submit to God. Whoa, submit? Wait a second. Is that word really in the Bible? Haven't they changed that? No, still there. <laughs> still there. And that's what we need to do. James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, how do you submit to God? How do we do it? It's simply doing what God tells you to do. Now, I listen to a lot of different sermons, and one of the sermons, I, or one of the pastors I listen to is, is a preacher uh, down in Southern California, and he has got a really big church, and sometimes he will open up the mic to the audience, and they can ask him questions. And it's always interesting when that happens, and I was watching this one particular video, and a little nine-year-old girl took the microphone, and so he says, okay, sweetheart, well, what's your question? And she says, well, how do we know, how do I know if I really love Jesus? And he thought for a second, and he said, well, he says, do you love Jesus? And she said, well, yeah, but, but how? I think I, I do, but how do I really know? And he said, well, let me ask you this. Do you love your parents? And she said, yes. And he said, well, do you do what your parents ask you to do? Well, most of the time, she said, you know, she did. She said she did. Uh, and he said, well, that's how you know if you love Jesus, if you do what he tells you to do. Just like you, love your, you show your love for your parents, when you do what they want you to do. He said, that's how we know that we love Jesus. And isn't that the truth? If we do what he tells us to do. And there's, we have his commands. We know what the commands are. And you think, well, that's so simple. Just do what he... No, it's not. <laughs> there are some things in there that are kind of tough. And we can't do them under our own power. But we can do them under his power. Under the grace that he gives and as we do that, we gain the favor of the Lord. All right, number four. Uh, we humble ourselves and gain the favor of God when we resist the devil. When we resist the devil. James 4, 7 again. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, our daughter was just the sweetest little girl that there ever could have been until she turned 13. <laughs> and then somebody replaced her and gave us this other person. But uh, while she was growing up, she had a younger brother. That was Tim. So a lot of you know who Tim is. And um, Tim, little brother, would pick on his older sister. And she was bigger than he was at that time. She was stronger than he was. But she would just take it. She wouldn't do anything. He would kind of, you know, try to hit her, or pull her hair, or antagonize her. And she would just take it. That was just kind of her personality. And so he was taking advantage of that. And, and he got in trouble with that from his mother and I. Uh, but we would encourage our daughter. We had to pull her aside and say, 
You know, we've always taught you not to hit other people or not to fight with others. But we said, there's a time where you need to fight back. You need to defend yourself. And if someone does something to you, sometimes you have to do it back to them just to kind of get their attention, confront them, resist them, as our verse is saying here. And it took her a long time to figure that out. But one day, she finally turned on him, and that was the end of it. He didn't bother her anymore because she kind of wailed on him a little bit. She resisted back. Now, we have an enemy, the devil, who wants to antagonize us. He wants to push us around. He, he knows our buttons. He knows how to get us going. And if we just allow him to do that, because honestly, he is stronger than we are in our own strength. But we have the Lord, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And you know the verse that says, Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. So when Jesus went to the cross, one of the things he did was he defeated the devil. But we don't always remember that. We need to. We, the, the verse here says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right, and then by doing that, we humble ourselves. We gain the favor of the Lord. Number five, we humble ourselves and gain the favor of the Lord when we take the initiative and draw near to God. James 4, 8 again says, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. So it says, draw near to God. In other words, we take the first step and then he will draw near to you. Now we have a couple grandchildren. I've talked about them before. Uh, our little granddaughter is two years old and her older brother is four years old. And she adores her older brother. And she would do anything to get his attention. And he's kind of a little bit annoyed with her usually. Uh, uh, she's younger and all, but sometimes they play this little game. And when they come to our house, the, it's, it's a bigger house and they have room to run. And uh, they'll run around the, in the kitchen, around the kitchen table, and he, he'll get her to, to chase him. And she gladly, oh boy, I get to chase him. He, I, get, I get to get his attention. She will chase after him. And he's faster than she is. And he will run just fast enough so that she can't quite catch him, but it keeps her interest and that'll go on for a while. And finally, he will actually let her catch him. And she'll grab him, and she'll, they'll fall down, and she'll hug on him, and he'll let her do that for a while. <laughs> and you know, that's kind of the way it is with God. We need to pursue him. He wants to be chased by us. Now, he pursues us, and he has different ways of doing that, but he really wants us to be the chaser. He wants to be the one that is pursued. And when we do that, the promise is that he will draw near to us. He will be caught. You will search for me with, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So that's how we draw near to God. Number six, we humble ourselves and gain favor of the Lord when we cleanse our hands of our sins and purify our hearts by inwardly renewing our minds. And that's there in James 4.8. Uh, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, what does it mean to cleanse your hands? Let's talk about the disease a little bit here, the virus that's going around. That we don't like to talk about it that much. We're tired of it. But my neighbor came down with COVID here a couple weeks ago. And it was right at the time when that big storm hit. And I told you last week, the, the rains, the tree in his backyard soaked up so much rain that it split in two. And so half the tree was in my yard and the other half the tree was in his yard. And he had COVID. And so did his wife, actually. They, they both had it. And, they, and their daughter, by the way. Uh, and we knew that. But there was a tree down in the yard. It, it crushed our fence. And so I, we were out there looking at it and just 
assessing the damage, and he came out on his back porch. Now we're quite a ways away, so you know, I, you know, I know he's got COVID, so I'm not getting close. But we began to talk, and we knew a guy that would, had he had already offered to come out and, and saw that tree up for us, and he was going to do it for $150 for our part. And so I said, well, just uh, if, what if my neighbor wanted you to, I said, that's a pretty good price. Said, what if my neighbor wanted you to do, well, he said, since most of the tree is on his side, he said, if he'll, if he'll do it for 250 for him. And so here was my neighbor out on the back porch, and I yelled over to him, hey, I've got a guy that would do, would clean this up, and your part would be 250 do you want to do it? And he said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. And so we called up a guy, he came out and chopped up the tree. Well, the guy that chopped up the tree wanted to be paid in cash today. And so I had uh, told this to, to the neighbor uh, ahead of time. So he said, uh, he said he would take a plastic bag and he would put the money out on his front porch. And so I said, okay, okay, we can do that. And so he did. When, when the whole thing was over, well, then somebody had to go pick that up. Who's going to do that? Well, I had to say, okay, I, I'm going to have to do that. So I put on a pair of gloves, and I went over, and I picked that baggie up by the corner of the bag, and I put it in a paper bag sack and stuck it in the pickup of the guy that cut up the tree. Now, I was taking a chance, and immediately, what did I do when that was over? I went in the house, and I washed my hands, and I sang happy birthday two, three times. Well, I was washing my hands. I was cleansing my hands. <laughs> now, I got to thinking about that later. That was kind of stupid. That was kind of taking a chance. And what if I would have caught the virus just from that bag, just from handling that? I, I could have. Uh, what would have been a better way? I thought, you know, I could have just called him on the phone. I could have just paid the guy up front, got the money from my neighbor later. I just wasn't thinking. I wasn't being very smart. And you know, when this is talking about cleansing our hands as sinners, it's talking about individual sins that we are aware of, that we know we need to clean up. And so James is telling us, cleanse your hands. If you want to humble yourself, take care of those things in your life. Now, I don't know what it is in your life that needs to be cleaned up. I know what it is in mine. And that's, we need to cleanse our hands of that. But even further than that, we need to purify our hearts. And I would have purified my heart. I would have done the right thing had I just called him on the phone and said, I've got his phone number. I could have told my neighbor, hey, we'll, we'll collect the money later. Don't worry about it. Uh, but no, I took a chance. And so I had to go wash my hands, you know, real fast and, and take my time doing that. All right, so anyway, the, the main thing is we need to purify our hearts. And we do that by engrafting God's Word into our hearts, spending time with the Lord. Uh, and, and as we do that, the, the cleansing of our hands really won't matter that much because those things will just go away. They'll, they'll be gone. All right, uh, number seven. We humble ourselves and in favor of the Lord when we get serious about serving Jesus. And James 4, 9 says, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now that verse has kind of bothered me because there's other verses that said, Rejoice in the Lord. Uh, uh, always, again, I tell you, rejoice. Aren't we supposed to be happy? As Christians, and yes, that's true. But we also need to be serious about this game, this, this thing, this Christian life that we're in. And it reminded me of when I was in high school, my senior year. I was on the football team, and we had a, a football game in the Dalles. And my youth minister that was my mentor at the time, he had helped me to go to our team and ask anyone that wanted to pray before the games. Right before the games, we'd, we'd go in the shower room and we'd pack that thing out with anybody that wanted to pray before the game. And we'd pray that no one would get hurt and, you know, get really serious about things. 
And so, uh, but this football game was in the Dalles. It was two and a half hour bus ride, school bus ride, which is, you know, for seniors in high school, that's a long trip. So my buddy and I, my buddy was a guy that liked to joke around. And there were a group of us on the bus that we were just laughing and carrying on all the way up to the Dalles. But there was this one guy on our team that he was having nothing to do with it. And he wouldn't laugh at jokes. And he just had his head down. He was serious. He was thinking about the game. And so anyway, then we got to the stadium and we got our alert pads on and everything. Well, it was time to pray. And so I said, hey, anybody that wants to pray? Let's go all meet in the showers. Well, this, this guy that was being real serious, he came up to me and he said, how can you do this? You've been joking around all day, carrying on, laughing, and now you want us to be serious? He says, I'm not coming to your prayer thing. And he stomped off. And I got to thinking about that later. I thought, he has a point. And, you know, it's okay to, to there's a time to joke around and carry on. But what we are involved in as the church, this is, this is bigger than a football game. This is real life. People are hurting out there. People need what we have to give them, and we're joking around about it. We're not serious. We need to get serious. And as we do, then we gain the favor of the Lord, and we humble ourselves. All right, in conclusion, you know, the most important way for us to humble ourselves, not just to get serious, but to admit that we don't have it all together. We don't have all the answers. We need a Savior. We need a Helper. We need the Holy Spirit within us. We can't do it by ourselves. And so if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, humble yourself. Have Him come into your life and gain the favor of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you today admitting that I don't have it all together. I've tried to make things work out on my own, but I have failed, Lord, as you well know. Lord, I see now that I need a Savior, and I accept what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me, that he paid the price for my sin on the cross, that I might have eternal life. Thank you for that. And Lord, I want your favor. Help me to walk in your ways that your mercy and grace would be upon me and not your hand of discipline. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Amen.